Hey, it's Mark Podolsky of Land Geek, the favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's Art of Passive Income podcast, I've got a big deal. I'm going to put on my anchorman voice. It's Kevin Bupp. Now, Kevin's been on the podcast several times, but it's been a, it's been a while, Kevin, right? It's been a while. I don't know how long, but it's been, definitely been a few years. It's sure. been a few years. So just to refresh you, because I'm sure all of you already know him anyways. Uh, Kevin is, he leads the strategic vision of uh, Sunrise Capital Investors. He's the host of two top-ranked, not one, two top-ranked real estate podcasts regarding investing. Uh, his real estate investment advice has been downloaded millions of times by folks in over 190 countries with over $250 million of real estate transactions under his belt. Kevin's extensive investment experience spans the gamut of apartment buildings, single-family homes, office buildings, parking facilities, which I can't wait to hear more about, raw land, condos, and of course, mobile home parks. He is the host of the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast and the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow Podcast. Kevin Bupp, welcome. Mark, thanks for having me back, man. I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm excited. So when we first talked, you were only doing, I believe, mobile home park investing. You'd really sort of become... Uh, the bigger player in that niche. So tell me what has changed since last time we talked. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. You're, you're right. I mean, you know, we've been doing mobile home parks, buying mobile home parks for, for over a decade now. And, you know, prior to that, prior to this past decade, you know, I've, I've owned kind of across the, you know, the board, uh, across the spectrum of different commercial asset classes, apartment buildings, portfolio of single family properties, office, retail, self-storage, all that. And, and, um, I do have some of my fingers still in some of that stuff in a passive manner today, but uh, not in an active space. So mobile home parks, kind of our core asset, bread and butter, but parking lots and parking garages have been a an asset that had been on my radar for probably about four years, just by happenstance, interviewed a guy on my show, my podcast many years back. I love niches. I love niche things like, you know, like land investment, right? right. Um, and interviewed a guy about parking. I didn't know too much about that. I, actually, I knew nothing about the asset class or really the investment side of it. And I was intrigued. He piqued my interest enough to where it never, it never left my brain. And for a year, I continued to think about it. And for the next year, I thought about it more. And then we finally started attending conferences and really diving in deep into the asset class. And at present time, we've got about uh, about sixty million dollars worth of parking assets in our portfolio, and uh, and are continuing to buy. So, just love every bit of it. Love the fragmented nature of it. Um, it's not an overly competitive environment. Um, probably a lot of people listening don't know anyone in their immediate network or even their expanded network that actually owns a parking lot or a parking garage. You might, but the majority probably don't, right? And so, it's just uh, it's about as niche as raw land gets. <laughs> okay, let, let's talk about what you love about parking lot investing. Yeah, let's talk about. Uh, some of the things that you don't love. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, you know, we look at it as a cash flow, uh, cash flow uncovered land play in in highly desirable locations, and so, um, you know, or, or irreplaceable locations is a better way to put it. So, I, I get, I, I'm going to use an example of of why I love it, and I'm going to use a, a recent deal that we just closed a couple months ago. Um, this is in Clearwater Beach, so in our backyard. Um, it's a seven story parking deck that was. Uh, a partnership between the city and a local developer. They built it six years ago. It is literally a block from the beach. There is a moratorium of parking uh, in Clearwater Beach. A lot of the surface parking lots at the present time are being redeveloped right now into towers. They've, re they've re you know, the, uh, the city's removed the parking uh, minimum requirements from the developer so they don't have to build a certain number of spaces per square foot. And so they're only building as much parking as what they're needed for the hotel because they want more rooms. They want as many rooms as possible. And so what that means, it creates a major supply demand imbalance for parking. And we have literally the last parking garage that will ever be built solely for parking in Clearwater Beach. And it's an acre footprint. We take up an entire acre, one block from the intercoastal waterway, one block from the Gulf of Mexico. That's an irreplaceable location. And there was a lot of opportunity there. It was being run by the city. And so a lot of these parking garages, they're... They've got antiquated practices in place, uh, and this was a fairly newly built one, but it still had it had antiquated, uh, um, you know, operational practices in place. Uh, they hadn't raised the rates for literally since the place opened. Uh, they were literally a third of what the market rate was. Um, they had uh, poor software. Uh, they had a poor asset manager that oversaw the property, and so a lot of those same things exist with other parking lots. What I have found is that the fragmented nature of this parking industry. Um, there's lots of generational families that own surface parking lots in cities, and uh, they literally are running them the same way they ran them 30 years ago. They don't leverage technology. They don't leverage the many different apps that exist nowadays that help people direct people to available parking spaces. 
um, for events or, or, or sporting, um, you know, venues and things of that nature. Uh, a lot of them don't even, they don't even accept credit cards. Um, you know, one of the other deals we bought in, in North Carolina, it literally had a lot of tenant there. And I guarantee half the money was probably going to that lot of tenants pocket. They didn't accept credit cards. They didn't have any dynamic pricing models in place that adjusted for, um, you know, high demand peak times. And then, you know, any, you know, or lower the rates when there was troughs, you know, in the demand. And so, uh, there's just that exists. It's all across the board. It's 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 baffling to me of how fragmented this industry is and how behind the times is. In fact, it reminds me a lot of mobile home parks ten years ago or fifteen years ago. No one wanted to give them a, even a look. I mean, it's just it was just this old mom and pop underground industry, and those that knew knew, and those that didn't they didn't. And I feel like the park industry is kind of that way. It's gotten passed over um, for the most part. So. Uh, well, and then last, la- lastly, you know, how we look at it as well is like, I know that as it sits today as a parking lot or parking garage, that is its lowest use. It will, based on its location, it will only ever have a higher and better use at a future date. Uh, it, it, you know, especially a surface parking lot, it, it will never be worth anything less than what it is as, at a, as a surface parking lot, whether it's gravel or, or asphalt, like, right? It's going to have a higher intrinsic value once uh, a future development takes place. So that's what we look for. It totally makes sense. And uh, it's so funny because every time you go to a, a sporting event, you see there's no parking. It's $10 or $20 to mm-hmm. park. The closer it is to the stadium, you pay it. And it's just the way it is. And I've always wondered, well, who owns these parking lots? And it's just a mom and pop industry. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, there's obviously a lot of municipalities that own parking garages and lots. Um, there's lots of uh, even sporting venues, you know, uh, you know, a lot of times the you know, sporting franchise might actually own maybe the primary lot or a couple of the primary lots surrounding a particular venue. Um, but then a lot of the others um, are owned by private individuals. Either there's a small a small um, contingent um, of the parking industry that's owned by larger institutions or private equity groups. But a lot of times that's kind of like, um, you know, parking garages that are in Manhattan or downtown Chicago that are, you know, uh, associated with maybe a high rise tower or something along those lines. Very different than, than the type of assets that we're looking for. Sure. Sure. So knowing what you know now about parking lots, the business of parking lots, the fractured nature of it, what would you do differently? Yeah. Um, would have probably started buying them earlier on. I mean, that, that's probably the best way to answer that. I mean, we're, we're kind of all in now, you know, we pound the phones, our team pounds the phones on a daily basis. We do a lot of direct mail. We kind of do a lot of the same things that we did in the mobile home park space and pretty much every other asset class that we've ever buy. We, you know, we create a database. We know the markets that we'd like to buy in. We identify the assets in those marketplaces. We, you know, skip trace all the owner, owner data. And then we just, go after them. Right. I mean, we, we document all of our conversations in the CRM. We set follow-up, uh, you know, appointments, try to open a dialogue up with them and, and keep that dialogue rolling until, you know, the timing is right. <laughs> Whether he, there's always a point in time when a, when an owner either needs or wants to sell. Right. And, um, right. and our objective is to be in front of them when that time comes in their life. So, uh, for example, the one we bought here in Clearwater, um, it was the right time for the city. The city was partnered in this deal. They got the short end of the stick. They did a poor job negotiating with the original developer to build it. Shame on them. Um, they it never met their performers. They weren't doing well. It was it was um, that capital that they allocated to that deal um, was not giving them an ROI at all. I found out that they had a new project happening that they were short about twenty million dollars for. Um, it was a perfect time for them to reallocate the capital from this parking garage into this new project, and so. I also found out that the developer really didn't like the city as a partner. They had, they had they hated partnering with the city. And I saw an opportunity to help both those parties exit out of it. And we assembled it together and, and it was a win-win all the way around. So um, there's lots of opportunities like that out there. So long as you're willing to pound the pavement and find them. I, I love it. So let's, let's juxtapose that mobile home park investing versus parking lot investing. Which, which asset? I mean, they seem similar in the fact that you're you're really buying the dirt, yeah, you're not you're not the one putting in the mobile home parks. You're not you don't own the parks. I'm sorry, you don't own the homes. You own the park. You own the infrastructure, for the most part. Yes, right. You're, you're collecting your lot rent, or you're collecting your mm-hmm. your car rent. It seems like it's once it's it's acquired, very little maintenance. You might have one person in, in the park. Helping out one, you know, one parking attendant or two, 
whatever it is. Is that the way you look at it, or is, am I thinking about it differently? Yeah, I mean, you am know, I missing it's, it? it's hard to compare apples to apples. You know, housing is fairly easy and straightforward to to understand. Everyone needs a roof over their head, right? It's it's one of their basic needs, and so long as you're buying a mobile home park in a in a market that has a demand for affordable housing, which is a large portion of the United States. I'm not going to say the entire United States has that that problem. There's plenty of areas in this country, Flint, Michigan, for example, and no no. You know, I'm not not shooting down Flint, Michigan. I just know that I can go into MLS now and probably buy a house for fifteen thousand dollars, right? Like, right. There's not necessarily a, a huge demand for affordable housing, and there's a surplus of, of vacant homes in that in that market, right? And so, but generally speaking, uh, if you go into a good market that that's got the economics that support, um, you know, uh, you know, growth, but also that demand for affordable housing, fill that void. Mo- mobile home parks are easy to understand. Um, on the flip side of that, you know, parking's got some additional complexities that. Um, th- that make it a little bit more challenging. It's not as easy as just saying like everyone's got a car when needs to park that car, right? You know, we look at we look at parking assets, but more importantly, we look at um, you know the market they're in, but also what are the demand drivers? Like who who's actually parking in that lot? And if I see that you know it's a parking garage, it's in a great city, great location, but literally ninety percent of the parkers that are parking there are associated with the office building across the street. That's concerning to me. Because if, you know, again, look at COVID, what happened with the office environment, right? Like things shifted right. quite drastically. And we don't know what that's going to look like when it comes out the other end. And one would, I would definitely take the, uh, I would take the odds against it actually ever looking like it did pre-COVID. And, and so that's going to drastically impact uh, the revenue of that parking uh, facility. And uh, it might not ever come back, right? Um, and so I want to know that there's a memo of five parking demand drivers. I want to know that they're they're fa- fairly even keeled that one is not proportionally so overweighted than the other four. And so I want to know that there's, you know, for example, sporting venues, um, nighttime traffic after business hours, nighttime traffic would be bars, restaurants, nightclubs, things of that nature. You got daytime office traffic. You've got um, uh, residential units in the area that might not have their own parking, which is pretty common in, in urban environments, um, you know, where they, they're paying for monthly parking. You've got uh, employees of other surrounding businesses that that are working that ultimately have you know monthly parking passes to work there and you know so like there's a v- wide variety of different demand drivers that we're looking for and I want to know that if any one of those falls off, which it could you know again i.e. office <laughs> if right. that falls out I still I know that I've, I've got eighty percent revenue retention and I can figure out how to to fill the void there I can't figure out if I lose ninety percent of the revenue how to fill that void it, it just we're buying we're buying these these parking assets on an income basis, and if all that income goes away, all I really got left is a big concrete structure, which it's got some value to it, but it's probably what I paid for it probably is much greater than that of if I demoed it and what that land value was worth. And so, um, so again, more complexities when you compare parking to to that of mobile home parks. But again, it's not overly complex by any means, and um, just understanding those basic fundamentals, I think. Uh, those that are listening in here could could easily identify, hey, like this parking lot in my city. Now I understand a little bit more. Like I know that it's used for daytime traffic. It, there's night. I, there's a bar I go to. I park there after hours, and you know, you know, the the stadium's right around the corner. I know that that place fills up at for forty bucks a car. You know, during the games, things they can get a sense of like that. That's probably a prime lot. And that thing kicks butt and makes a lot of money. You know, that could be an opportunity. Right. right. Yeah. A- absolutely. So let's talk about the economics of it as far as mm-hmm. buying, say, a smaller parking lot and and what you would look at i mean so first of all let's just define cap rates could you just mm-hmm. quickly define it for the audience yeah i mean a cap rate is the you know if, if you're looking at it from an unlevered standpoint if you um you know if you had a a, a property that you paid a million dollars for and ultimately it produced uh, you know um sixty thousand dollars of, of of revenues on an annual basis uh you basically bought that at a six percent unlevered cap rate you know cash and cash returns once you factor leverage into into the play cash and cash returns are, are, are you know more of a boosted levered um cash on cash or uh, uh, anyway it's a it's i'm not going to go into details there but sure. you know, speaking to cap rates uh as far as like parking I, you're a value add investor as am I. And so, you know, it's hard. Every time I talk to a broker on the phone, I always get asked, you know, they always ask me like, what cap rate are you guys looking for? I hate that question. It, it just, it, it doesn't fit into the dialogue of what our business model is because I'm looking for opportunities that where the value hasn't yet been maximized. You know, there's inefficiencies in the operations. And so I don't necessarily care what the cap rate is today because if I'm, 
I bought many deals at four caps, which our model doesn't support four caps uh, at all. Like we would never be able to pay our investor returns at a four cap. And so um, I want to know that what, what is my potential stabilized cap rate? You know, after I actually implement the value add plan, what, where can I get to in a stabilized cap rate? And so to, to, to answer that question better, um, as far as what we're looking for, uh, in order to hit our economics, like we need to be able to get to a stabilized cap rate of somewhere in the 7% range. And we do put minimal leverage on our properties. We've got about a 55 to 58% loan to value across our entire portfolio. So it's fairly low leverage. Um, you know, we could probably juice the returns a little higher if we were willing to take more risk, but I like low leverage. It's safe. And uh, I don't have to worry too much. if, Especially if, when if, interest rates are going up. Yeah, it, that's it. Unless it, you buy the, did you buy, do you typically buy the rate? What do you mean by do I typically what, buy so the rate? Do, so we, the, do we put like a, a, a lock in or a, like a lock, um, yeah, you lock the yeah. rate. Yeah. Yeah. If, it, it depends what kind of debt you were getting. Um, that's that's very doable with like Fannie Mae and, and Freddie Mac debt on the residential side. Um, you can you can buy rate caps and that's not necessarily uh, always available, very rarely available when you're dealing with like traditional banks or credit unions or um, you know, regional lenders and things of that nature. So when we can, we do. Um if, if, if the economics makes sense to do that. Um, and, and so like, there goes the, you know, one of the big risks with investing nowadays, like there's so much volatility with rates that if you're underwriting a property uh, and you're drawing out a pro forma uh, based on, you know, a certain, certain debt terms that you feel you're going to be able to achieve. And the Fed has been meeting month, month after month, right? And like, you know, the 10 years been all over the place for the past uh, couple of weeks. And so, you know, you're literally shooting at a moving target. It's really, really challenging right now. And so if you don't have the ability to get a, a, a you know, a rate cap in place and, you know, you need to do your best job at actually negotiating on the front end, some type of buffer, right. And, and sure. um, it's still a competitive marketplace and that's really challenging to do. There's still a lot of capital looking for a home and looking for a return. And, um, and, and so, you know, that's, it, it's tough right now. It's a very tough environment. I will say that we've had a few deals die and I hate seeing deals die. And the only reason they died over the past six months has been due to the interest rate volatility. We've had a few deals and unfortunately sellers went, they didn't see it through our eyes. Right. You know, expectations weren't, weren't similar. Um, and, uh, and ultimately things fell apart due to a change in rate of, you know, 50 or 75 basis points, which on a multi-million dollar deal, um, it's a, it's, it's a fairly drastic difference in, in, in yeah. monthly payments and debt service. No. So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It is. Yeah. And so, hey, um, but anyway, go, go ahead. Can you depreciate a parking lot? You can, you can, you can I mean, depreciate a parking lot. Great. Yeah. I mean, you know, really all your depreciation, there's no, most of the time there's no infrastructure there. You know, th there's a chance that if you put like a pay station in, there's, you've got some, you know, um, electrical wiring and, you know, there's a chance there could be water and, and, and another type of plumbing, but really all you have is you've got an asphalt, you've got an asphalt, you know, pad there, or maybe even gravel. It just depends. So there's not a lot to depreciate, but you, you can, it just, it might, you have to, you have to weigh the benefits of the cost of the actual cost seg study and, right. um, and whether or not you want to go that route. So mobile home parks on the flip side, are one of the most tax efficient asset classes that exist. And so um, we're typically able to take, uh, you know, in the ballpark of 70 to 73% year one, you know, with, with the, you know, bonus depreciation laws that are currently in effect. So it's, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's crazy. And I, I always tell people when they're like, well, what do you do after you get to a certain point with, with your land investing and you want to do bigger deals? I'm like, well, land investing is the gateway drug to get into mobile home parks because it's the next, it's really the next step up and it's, it's not too different. And the headaches are really minimal compared mm -hmm. to say multifamily apartment buildings. And yeah, um, I mean, it can be, I, you know, I always like to say that there's, there's, there's many different, um, you know, grades when I'm speaking to the quality of like, I like to use the example of, you know, speak to the neighborhood you live in. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I can drive 20 miles in one direction or another. I don't know which direction is where you live, but I could drive 20 miles and be in a ghetto, single family home, but kind of the ghetto. I could drive the other direction and be in a blue collar version of that. And I can drive to the wealthy part of town where you live, Mark. Right. And, and the same thing exists with mobile home parks. I mean, there's some really dumps like, you know, think of Eminem eight mile, the movie. He lived in one of the scary parts of town, right? And then that mobile home park, there were shootings and drugs and all that stuff. Then there's very much blue cat, you know, blue, blue collar, hardworking folks uh, that they take care of their lawns, they mow the grasses, they make, you know, $18 an hour and they, you know, they want their kids to go to a good school and, and, um, you know, they appreciate life as we do. Uh, and then you got 
maybe not high, but like you get in places like Florida and, and where you live out there in, in the Phoenix uh, MSA and, you know, some of these retirement, retirement communities, they're not affordable housing at all. I mean, you've got lot rents that are, you know, a thousand plus dollars a month. And these are, these are communities that have, you know, three clubhouses, four swimming pools that, you know, they've got activities, directors, and, and people live there by choice, you know, and, and, and they, they can probably afford a condo somewhere else, but they live there by choice. And so again, um, it's just a broad spectrum, um, you know, when we speak to, you know, what type of tenants we're dealing with and the same goes with multifamily. And so I guess, you know, I think mobile home parks are more apples to apples comparison um, to, to, to multifamily when you look at the different qualities. But the one benefit the, that mobile home parks have, again, speaking to the, the model of where you don't own the home itself, if you truly just own the underlying dirt and in a perfect world, we would. Uh, I think about 20 percent of our portfolio, we own the homes, not by choice, but because we have to or we acquired it that way. Um, but, but when you don't own that home, the overhead and maintenance and the just just the. Um, uh, the ongoing uh, tenant relations is very minimal. In fact, we've got some residents that have lived in our communities that own their home. They've lived there for more than 40 years. Wow. Uh, in fact, they pass it down generationally, just like you would a single family home. Like that's how they view it. Right. And uh, this is their home. They've lived there for 40 years. They're going to give it to their daughter and their daughter raises the family there. That's very common um, in the manufactured housing space. That is not so common in, in multifamily, right? You got, you turn over that unit every 12 to 18 months with, you know, with, without failure, they're moving somewhere else more than likely. Exactly. Well, I, I love the niches you're in. This has been a, as always, uh, an enlightening and educational conversation. But Kevin, we're at that point now in the podcast where I'm going to ask you for one more tip of the week, a website, a resource, maybe a book, something else actually yeah. for the auto passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? I'm not going to give you a website, a resource or, or a book. I'm going to give you something else. And, um, you know, we, we were down here in Southwest Florida and uh, obviously I'm in the Tampa, Tampa Bay area. We were supposed to get by this hurricane uh, that just came up the coast here. And, and those to the South of us were, were not the luck. They, they were, the, they were the unlucky ones two hours South. And I got to go down there the other day. We took a bunch of supplies down and, and, you know, got to see like the impact zone and, and meet families that have lost. I mean, there, there was a lot of losses during this one. And I would say, I'm going to suggest to everyone, like just, hug a loved one, right? You know, you know, hug your wife, hug your, 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 your husband, your kids, tell me, love them. I mean, call your parents. If you haven't talked to your parents or a friend, you know, a great friend that you just haven't talked to in quite some time or whoever that might be that you've lost that bond with a connection, like just take the time to like, remember the things that really matter. Right. Cause like the things I had to saw, like things that just wiped away in an instant and life is never the same again. So just cherish the moment that you're in and, uh, you know, again, hug the loved one. I love that. I love that. And uh, it's so funny. I was listening to this uh, podcast on the Waking Up app, just interview with people that talking about death. And this one uh, person that had written a book on it said, you know, the five things that people before they die, when they connect with their loved ones, they should say, I forgive you, forgive me, something in that order. Um say, so, uh, thank you. Mm-hmm. I love you. And I'm proud of you is like the fifth one. And so you don't have to wait. Yeah, that's you're it. You don't have to wait. So to do it now is fantastic. Yeah. Um, that's it. my tip of the week is learn how you can invest with Kevin. And so <laughs> go to sunrise capital investors.com sunrise capital investors.com. Is that correct? Or that's is it? it? Or, okay. Yeah, sunrise and sunrise investors, uh, sunrise capital investors dot com, not sunrise investors. Sunrise capital investors dot com, or the, the, you know the direct way, invest with sunrise that that will get you to our current offerings. And then, Mark, I'd love to. We didn't talk about this beforehand, but I just I'd love to give a free copy of the book. I I just published it like four months ago. Um, you know, your listeners can grab a free copy by going to kevinbup dot com forward slash free book, and uh, it's for sale on Amazon for twenty bucks. But I've got a free full PDF version of it. It's it's the cash flow investor. It's about investing in commercial real estate. Um, we cover a litany of asset classes in there and go into detail on them. And it's a, uh, it's a great primer for those that are, um, you know, considering other types of real estate investments. So we'd love if I could give that free copy away, if you wouldn't mind. I love it. That's so generous. I will have links to both wonderful places to go. Invest with sunrise.com, kevinbutt.com, kevinbutt.com forward slash free book. It'll all be there. We'll get it right. Anyways, Kevin, are we good? 
I think we're good, my friend. It's always good seeing you. Always good seeing you. I'm going to thank the listeners, remind them the only way, the only way we're going to get quality guests like a Kevin Bupp is if you do three little favors, follow, rate, review the podcast, send a screenshot of that review, support at thelandgeek.com. I'm going to send you for free a signed copy of Dirt Rich. Today's podcast is sponsored by Flight School. Learn more, go to landgeek.com forward slash training. One, two, three. Let freedom ring. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.